Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois again. It's good to be with you again. It's a beautiful fall day, cool. <clears throat> As I was driving to the hospital this week, I saw the first touches of color um, on the trees. Now down here, that means we may have a few sumac that are turning bright red, but most of our trees do brown really well. So. <clears throat> Let's not talk about COVID today. Okay. <laughs> Let's just charge right into a story. Last week, um, <clears throat> we started exploring the question, how did we get from there to here? How did we get from Sabbath as a holy day committed to God being a key touchstone in the lives of the people in the Bible to where we are today, where for most Christians, Sabbath doesn't exist. Or if it does exist, it's in such a highly modified form that it's unrecognizable. A worship hour or um, Yeah, how did we get from there to here, where for most Christians the word Sabbath is negative? So Vivian and I were newly married <clears throat> and on our honeymoon. Now our honeymoon consisted of one night in an RV parked in a state park and then a four-hour drive to the summer job that we were going to be working at a youth camp in the northern part of the lower peninsula of Michigan. And as we were driving, we were talking, and we discovered that we had dreams for what was going to happen that summer. The camp had a wonderful, fully stocked ceramics department, and Vivian was looking forward to making dishes for our home and serving dishes and vases. She was excited about the ceramics. I, on the other hand, had the loan of an Olympus SLR with a full battery of lenses, and I was looking forward to doing photography that summer. Um, I knew that ospreys and bald eagles sometimes visited the lake there at the camp. I knew that there were wildflowers and other birds. All of my, my, my passion for nature was channeled into photography and I was looking forward to that. But as we were talking, we realized that both of these hobbies, these passions, involved money and we were poor college students. Uh, we were working at the camp uh, to earn our tuition for the next year, and we would receive no pay. So any money that we spent had to come out of our meager savings. And as we talked about our dreams, we rapidly realized that our dreams exceeded our pocketbook. Which then led to a discussion as to whose dream was more important and merited the most investment. <clears throat> the discussion got quite heated, but eventually a tense silence descended. Our first marital discord. Oh. We drove for a while in silence, and then Vivian said, what would you think of? And she suggested a possible solution. What would you think of us each having an allowance each month that we could spend however we wanted? Wow. How much would that be? And the discussion, conversation now, rapidly refocused on from our dreams to 
the practical realities that we would be facing at the end of the summer. How much money did we need to have each month in order to make ends meet? Now, I was blessed with a wife who is very skilled at creating budgets and she had already been doing research on this and she she knew how much our rent was going to be she already had an estimate of how much we would need to spend for money I mean for clothing Ugh. and so they're in the car driving up to camp um, we very quickly agreed upon our monthly budget for the next fall and from there, then, we're able to back into how much margin we had, how much was left over that we could use as allowance. Now, we included other things than food and, and clothing and rent. Um, we knew that medical expenses were a possibility, and we included savings and some other things. <clears throat> but... We finally worked out a number, and we each got $25 a month. That was enough for me to develop three rolls of film. And she could... Well, that summer she made dishes, she made vases. We still have some of her creations here in our home today. I won't tell you how many years later. When I read the New Testament, I see the apostles wrestling with change that was just as integral as Vivian and I experienced at when we married and merged our lives. Okay? The memory of the change of the Sabbath that I'm addressing today is the memory that it was done away with at the cross. Now, there is no question that in the New Testament, the disciples are wrestling with what the cross meant. <clears throat> Gentiles are flooding into the church. And they're struggling with how, what that means. Peter has his vision of sheet coming down out of heaven with all of these unclean animals in it animals that Jews were forbidden to eat and he hears a voice telling him to eat and he says no I've never been eaten unclean things he was a good Jew and the voice says don't call unclean what God calls clean this happens three times and almost immediately after he has the vision, some Gentiles come and ask him to come to the home of Cornelius, an important Gentile. <clears throat> and in talking to them, Peter does not hesitate. He says, I will come to you because I have received a vision that tells me that I am not to call anyone unclean. The vision was never about food, people. The Bible clearly states what Peter understood the vision to be. Any other reading is an extrapolation and an overlay. He goes to Cornelius' house and he tells them his experience. Cornelius tells him about the angel that told him to send the messengers. And then the Holy Spirit descends and these Gentiles these uncircumcised Gentiles received the Holy Spirit in the same way that the apostles, these good Jews who follow the Jewish law, received it. And Peter is just astounded. He says, well, if they've been baptized, if they've been received the Holy Spirit, then what's to prevent us from baptizing them? And he baptizes all of them. And then he stays with them and eats with them, something that was forbidden by the Jews. Well, he gets called on the carpet for this, okay? There's a disciplinary action in the church against Peter for eating with 
the Gentiles. Because at this point in the church's history, righteousness meant being a good Jew. And that meant following all of the teachings of the rabbis. Jesus had told his disciples, do what they teach, not what they do. And so the early Christians were good Jews. They did Jewish things. But now these uncircumcised Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit, been baptized, and when Peter told his story, it just shook things up. What did this mean? And they rejoiced that the Gentiles, that the salvation had been opened to the Gentiles, but what did that mean? What Gentiles were supposed to be baptized? And how was a Gentile to live after baptism? Well, then Paul showed up on the scene and his ministry to the Gentiles began exploding and Gentiles started flooding into the church. And when he got back from his first missionary, Gentile, first missionary journey, um, he was met by some people from Jerusalem who said, you've got to be circumcising all of these, all of these Gentiles. And that led to the first church council, the first attempt to bring consensus within the church. But before we talk about that, we need to have some context here, okay? Uh, the Jewish worldview at the time appears to have divided people into Jews and Gentiles. You see that in the Bible. You also see reference to God-fearing Jews. Gentiles were divided into three classes. There were the heathens, or barbarians as the Jews called them, um, who were idolaters, they worshiped other gods, they had no interest in Jehovah uh, and God. Let me get the sun out of here just a bit. There we go. <clears throat> but then you had two two classes of Gentiles who had left idolatry and committed themselves to worshiping God. One group were called the righteous converts. They accepted circumcision. They became good Jews and they were treated as good Jews, which meant that when they went to the temple, they weren't excluded from coming into the, into the court of the temple. They were Jews. When they went to synagogue, they were allowed to sit with the men in the center of the synagogue. The other class were the God-fearing Jews, the converts of the gate. They worshipped God and they had abandoned idolatry, but they didn't undergo circumcision. And the rabbis had decided that these converts of the gate only needed to keep what they called the Noahide laws, the seven laws of Noah, which were seven rules that the rabbis could deduce from the book of Genesis. Um, don't murder. Don't fornicate. Sex outside of marriage. Okay? Don't take God's name in vain. Don't worship idols. Don't eat, f eat um, blood. Okay? There were seven rules that they had made, and most of them are in the Ten Commandments. The only two that are outside of the Ten Commandments are the prohibition on eating blood and the command to participate in setting up uh, the rule of law within the community. So these 
Converts of the gate, these limited converts, were only required to follow these seven laws, whereas the full converts, the righteous converts, were required to follow all of the rabbinic teachings and doctrines. When the Council of Jerusalem was called, they decided on a limited number of, of rules that, the sun is migrating on us here, of rules that these new converts would need to follow. In other words, they decided on a definition of righteousness that was more limited than what the full converts were required to do. So basically they said, if a Gentile wants to be a Christian, he doesn't have to become a righteous Jew, a righteous convert. He can become a limited convert and have full access to the community. That then is the context within which I view Paul's talking about the relationship between the law and his new converts. Because this, this, this ruling, this consensus in the leaders did not sit well with all of the church. There were still conservative Christians who said, no, to be a Christian, you have to be righteous, and to be righteous, you have to be circumcised, and you have to keep all of the the, the dietary restrictions. You have to you have to, to keep the feasts. Paul was not at all impressed with that logic, and so that's the context within which these passages uh, that I'm going to read um, come for me. Okay. Colossians 2 verse 14 blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross the handwriting of ordinances that's often translated as the law the Ten Commandments and all of the writings of Moses Moses now in the writings of the rabbis who were much closer to Christ's era when they, when they were writing, this word that's translated ordinances was used for the rabbinic rules, the traditions that they had added to the law. So it's tempting, based on this passage uh, and that understanding, to say he was talking about all the rabbinic code, not God's law, but what man had added to it, the traditions. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15, he puts it this way. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished it in his, abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make of himself t of twain one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereof okay. he's talking about something that existed in both the temple and in the synagogues in the temple there was a wall about three feet high that defined an outer area where Gentiles were allowed. But on that wall, and we actually have one of the inscriptions from that wall that was unearthed, on that wall were these stone inscriptions that said, no Gentiles beyond this point on pain of death. When they said, no Gentiles, they meant it. And there were armed guards stationed there. Okay. Paul almost lost his life when he was accused at the end, end of his ministry of taking a Gentile past that watchware. In the synagogues, 
there was no wall <clears throat> but you had a central chamber where the men were sat during worship then there was a screen on one side the women sat on the other side of the screen and then in another area even further away there was a second screen and all of the Gentiles of the gate had to sit back there. So to be a Gentile of the gate meant to be excluded, kept separate. Jews were allowed to eat with full converts. They were not allowed to eat or associated with, with part limited converts, the converts of the gate. And Paul is saying that partition has been broken down in Christ. Jew, Gentile, there is no difference when we accept Jesus Christ. Once again, it's easy because here too, the, that law, that wall between us that was broken down is contained in commandments, commandments contained in ordinances. You don't find that separation of Jew and Gentile in the Old Testament, in God's law. That was something that was added through the traditions. It's tempting to divide those two. Until we go back to Romans, Romans chapter 10. And in Romans chapter 10, Paul is talking about God's new standard of righteousness. I'm going to just start with verse 1 and read through verse, verse 5. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. My perspective is what he is saying is, being good isn't enough. Being good doesn't make you righteous, friends. We are only righteous when we are transformed from the inside by the power of God's Spirit living in us. It doesn't matter whether our behavior is good. Our hearts must be purified. And that's not something I can see in you. I can't see your heart and you can't see mine. Okay. What does this have to do with the Sabbath? Well, back in Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, I read verse 14 last time about the blotting out of the hand, handwriting, nailing it to his, the ordinances to his cross. In verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. That is the key passage that creates the confusion that the Sabbath was done away with at the cross. No one would say that the Ten Commandments were done away with at the cross. Well, some people do. But no one would say that it's okay for me to murder or steal or lie or commit adultery, even though Christians do that just as often as non-Christians. But we recognize that that is not appropriate behavior for people who have committed themselves to following God. The reference to Sabbath days in the Greek, that's a plural, plural, Sabbaths, 
And most of the time in the New Testament, when that language is used, it's referring to the ceremonial feasts. But Paul's point is, don't judge each other based on these religious behaviors. Why do I think the Sabbath was still a part of the life of the converts of the gate? Which is what Paul was arguing for. He was arguing that Gentiles who kept the Noah Noahite laws were living righteous lives. Why do I think the Sabbath was a part of that? Because they were in church every Sabbath. He met them at the synagogue. He taught them at the synagogue. And when they got out, kicked out of the synagogue, he met with them every Sabbath, it, again, teaching them. They were already Sabbath keepers. It was an assumed part of the definition. Not a memory that we've retained in Christianity. Even Sabbath keepers are unaware of the, the context. But for me, it's very meaningful. Okay? Jesus did not come away, come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. He's told us that himself. He didn't come to void God's word in the Old Testament or to create separate paths to righteousness for Jews and Gentiles. He calls all of us to committing our lives wholly to following him. There's one fourth memory that I wanted to follow, but I guess we'll have to do that next week because time speeds by. I enjoy spending time with your friends, okay? It's stimulating to me to share what I've learned. I hope you found value today. Be safe, be prudent, but above all, keep looking up, and I'll see you next week.